So, yeah, uh, most of the usual gang, I think, have assembled. So, uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, this is another in our uh, series from the Physical Sciences Machine Learning Nexus. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, now almost my old friend, uh, Klaus Robert Mueller, uh, from uh, his permanent job is at TU Berlin, but at the moment he's sort of on loan to Google Berlin. And he also has a uh, sort of part-time position uh, in uh, Korea, uh, where he goes for a few months every year. And also you're associated with some MPI Institute for Mathematics, uh, for Informatics, right? So Klaus is, you know, uh, one of the gurus, I would say, of... Uh, machine learning and has been doing it since long before it was fashionable uh, and especially he worked uh, in the old days with Vapnik and is very strongly associated with uh, uh, support vector machines uh, and, and many of the methods that we use today and in fact earlier in the series if you may recall in one of the earth system science talks they were using uh, uh, this heat map method for seeing where the information had come from in an image and how the algorithm had found it and that was a method that Klaus and his gang had developed just a couple of years uh, beforehand. I first met Klaus uh, about 10 years ago in fact at a mathematics institute at UCLA where uh, they were bringing people together from quantum chemistry and from uh, machine learning and we started talking and very quickly realized we had a lot of interests in common and did some uh, work together. But Klaus has been uh, uh, perhaps the major force in, in, in bringing a lot of machine learning techniques to modern electronic structure, material science, and quantum chemistry. Uh, so without further ado, uh, take it away, Klaus. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to um, you know, spend the last hour of the day um, uh, giving this seminar. Um, um, you see, I, I'm wearing a Norwegian sweater, which means that it's quite cold here in Berlin. Um, we have an um, unusual cold period of 12 degrees Celsius. You have to figure that one out. Uh, um, and um, so, um, yeah, I, I Thank Kieran for his kind words, um, and um, I think I'm not sure whether the lighting uh, um, uh, shows. I have a lot of grey hair, um, so which means that I have been doing machine learning for a while. Um, I guess since 30 years or so. Um, what I will be talking about um, is is mainly the journey where machine learning meets quantum chemistry and this a lot of people have contributed and um, I spared the work together with Kiron because he knows it already um, and perhaps many of you also know it already so um, but I you know the plan is this one already uh, Kiron remarked that you know we have had the IPAM programs um, at UCLA and there were two of them, 2011 and 2016, where we could closely interact, um, and of course in between. Um, and so I will be talking a bit about um, neural nets, um, insights, and also molecular dynamics. And so one of the, the bottom lines of this talk will be to, to ask, you know, what has actually machine learning brought into physics and um, what can we actually learn for machine learning from physics? So because this goes both ways. Um, and I think, you know, we will get um, tastes of both, hopefully. Yeah, I'll start um, just assuming that, that you 
you know, you're familiar with machine learning a bit, um, but I still go through the um, things that, that, that you need to put into, you would like to build this estimator, this machine learning estimator, F of X, um, predicting some Y. So there's a bunch of things that you need to, to do in order to get this F. The first thing is that you would like to know what you put into the learning. So this could be vectors, strings, graphs, tensors, whatever you have, right? And um, um, most of the time, um, the application tells you what the heck the data is about. So then the second thing is um, you have an optimization problem to solve. So um, in order to train your learning machine, you have something um, like, I'm not sure whether you see my error. Can you see the error? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so this is an optimization problem, for example, of a support vector machine. Um, where you see that you have to minimize um, some function over the parameters and there's some constraints. So, so this kind of error that you minimize or the score function, and um, this could be some squared error part. It could be also some divergences, but also it depends on, you know, what field you're in or, you know, whether you may be working for a company that could be also ranking errors uh, or also um, all sorts of other costs that are the true costs. So, so if you would work in the health sciences, you know, then there are some, some costs in getting a diagnosis wrong. And they, these are literally costs. Occasionally cost a life. So the cost is infinity in that and um, so depending on, on you know, what you know about your problem, it's already rather clear what is a natural way of measuring errors. The, the next thing is that, you know, this is basically in every machine learning model, is that you have not only the error measuring how strongly your function that you have estimated um, when you put in an xi, it deviates from the target value, but you also have some additional term that you know basically reflects your knowledge about the problem in some way. So perhaps your function should be smooth. So then this so-called regularizer should you know force the function to be not wiggly or simple or sparse or whatever you you would like to know your function to be. And um, finally, there's a number of, of hyperparameters, not the parameters of your model, but the hyperparameters. So, so, you know, for example, in this case, how strongly you regularize, um, you know, how strongly you smooth, um, how sparse you want to have things and so on and so forth. And um, so you have to select these models or, for example, you have to select the, the neural network architecture. And so, so this, these are, you know, not millions of parameters, but there are very few of them. Okay, and um, after you have done all this and put this together, then typically you have a learned model that you know gets an X and has some parameters. Um, these are now the hyperparameters, and this could be a neural network or kernel method or whatever. So just to remind you, you know, this is like the neural network part you put in something um, then this goes through a, a number of layers um, gets linear trendly transformed squeezed through nonlinearities transformed squeezed transformed squeezed turned whatever and in the end um, for example you have uh, the last layer which gives you a classification results or or some regression results or whatever. So um, if, if we have many layers, then this is called um, a deep neural network. So this above here would be the support vector machine and you have the, the equation um, that tells you how to, how to uh, get it. 
and the oops, uh, the standard um, um, e model of, of machine learning would be that you you take your data and then you have your model class, for example, kernel methods or neural nets, and then you would like to get these models to predict your data very well, but not only you, the data that you have, but also the unseen data, the one that you know you would like it to generalize on. And so, so the ultimate thing that you would like to get is you would like to get a model that generalizes well to everything that hasn't been seen. Okay, so now comes the 2011 um, IPAM workshop where we all spend some nice time in the Californian sun. But I mean, you're doing it all the time, but I, for me, it was during my sabbatical, um, which was a pleasure because I didn't have to wear the thick Norwegian sweaters in, in uh, summer. Um, and so also the pleasure was that, um, you know, I, having done my master's in theoretical physics back in the days on strings and, you know, quantum field theory and these, these type of things, um, and having spent all the time on machine learning, um, I came to this crowd of people, um, chemists, physicists, that always talked about the Schrodinger equation. And I thought, well, this is awfully familiar to me, um, except I've forgotten it. Um, and also, you know, there was only one machine learning dude in the program, and that was me. And so um, what I gathered was um, that, um, you know, in order um, to solve the Schrodinger equation, um, well, you can't solve it, but you can approximately solve it, um, which, uh, you know, for example, you would use DFT for it. And for this, you would, um, um, in this approximation, put in the nuclear charges or the coordinates where the atoms of the molecule sit and get the property that you would like to get the quantum mechanical property. And this, this I also gathered was um, a very um, tedious thing um, in the sense of using lots of computing time um, uh, for molecules less, but for materials more. Um, and so my understanding was that this is all very beautiful, comes from first principles. And now I'm saying something heretic um, because I thought, you know, it's all so clean and beautiful. It comes from the first principles. And then at some point, an approximation is made. And then, uh, you know, miraculous things follow. But the beauty of the first principles derivations it somehow gets lost there. That was my feeling. And um, therefore, I thought, why not just go, you know, slightly different and say, how about treating the whole um, problem as a machine learning problem, which means I treat the problem as a stochastic problem. And basically, I, I, I just don't do what mathematicians typically do, meaning save, uh, solving equations. But I, I try to get a machine learning model predict the outcome of an equation. Um, and so in this way, I, you know, I don't, you know, do all the first principle stuff, but I'm just learning from data. And um, of course, I'm learning from data that is computed from DFT and, and um, you know, theories that, that have this beautiful first principles uh, approach. So um, when I suggested doing this, um, people were not very amused. The mathematicians at IPAM didn't like it because you know, they were so used to solving equations instead of predicting their outcome. Um, and the chemists and physicists also didn't like the fact very much uh, that I treated their 
stuff, right? And so, um, but the interesting thing was that um, it actually worked. And I'll tell you how. So first thing um, was that if you, if you um, think about learning from, um, you know, in computer vision or anything, you need some data. So what's the data here? So we based our uh, first work on, on the GDB database, which is an enumeration by Bloom and Raymond um, of all stable um, um, compounds with um, a number of nodes, a maximum number of nodes. And you know that, that this, this is very in quickly increasing. So um, we stopped at GDB7, so which was about 8,000 compounds, put them on the Max Planck quantum computer, did DFT um, to get the quantum chemical um, um, results uh, for these compounds and, um, and then used this as training data. In fact, we used part of it as training data and then didn't look at the rest and trained our model and then predicted out of sample. So the, the, one of the key issues in, in machine learning is how do we compare things? So how would we compare the similarity of two molecules? Well, um, if you think about this molecule, um, you know, every atom has nuclear charges and coordinates. And then, um, you know, if you want to compare two um, molecules, you would basically um, like to, you know, first um, represent one molecule as a matrix. Um, in this case, we, we conceive the so-called Coulomb matrix, um, which is basically measuring on the off diagonal um, how um, strong the Coulomb interaction between the i and j's atom is, and we put z i z j, and on the diagonal we have this z i to the 2.4. Um, so, which means that the representation we're using are matrices. So, if we have two different molecules, then we need to compare two different matrices. So, the distance between the natural distance between two matrices is a Frobenius norm like this, and then we can put this. Uh, well, before we put things anywhere, of course, this is was the first start of a of a so-called descriptor or feature uh, set to describe a molecule and um, lots of other um, um, representations were suggested and even more of them a lot of time people just spend you know most of their time inventing new representations and then assuming that you fix yourself to one type of representation then um, and you take the distance between the, the molecule M and the molecule M prime, and the distance, well, in the case of the matrices, would be the Frobenius norm, and then you can put these into a kernel, um, and then um, you can put the kernel into a kernel-rich regression model, um, which is like a very simple kernel-based method, and um, you can train the kernel bridge regression model, which has parameters alpha and b, um, by minimizing this function. And the, the result of this minimization process, and you see here the regularizer, is essentially this. So you have to invert a matrix. And um, it's a matrix that has size number of um, data points times number of data points. So it's a piece of cake. Um, if you have thousand, um, um, you know, training data points, then you know this is like, uh, you know, fractions of a millisecond. Then you have your model, and that's it. So, um, and your prediction um, doesn't take hours. All right, the the prediction doesn't take hours. It takes fractions of a millisecond. Um, and if you compare this to the standard calculation of a 
you know, electronic structure method, then um, it's, it's much faster, a billion times faster. So um, now we can un try to see um, how good would this be? And we measure the absolute, the mean absolute error as a function of the training data that we have. And, and depending on our, um, you know, representation, we can get some more or less nice results. We started out with about 10K cal per mole, which was nothing to write home about, but still quite impressive if we um, think about the, the um, you know, simpleness of the idea. And, and then later we used neural nets and much later um, we used a much better representation. And finally we improved neural nets even more and other people came and we are now, um, you know, around 0.3 kK per mole, which is, you know, not, I, I guess quantum chemical accuracy. And that's not, on the training set, but it's out of sample. So, of course, um, out of sample needs to be taken with care. We cannot just widely go out of sample, but you know the the data that we can predict should be somehow in the in the same structural ballpark that that is sampled by the training set. Um, so. Of course, the most simple model that we could think of, um, and now people started be, to be excited about this because it sort of worked and, and uh, we got some, some progress on it. And so um, we, we could think about neural network and, and all sorts of other methods um, in order to improve on the very simple current ridge regression model. And this was one in 2017, we had this paper with a tensor, deep tensor neural network. Um, and you can basically see one level of the structure. And um, so you see the whole, whole uh, set of equation which describes the model, but, but I think um, it's, it's better to intuitively explain what has happened. So, so the first, iteration first layer is that we first embed the different atom types and then in the next um, layer of this neural network um, tensor neural network we add some some interactions um, so it's like uh, first you take the raw atoms at atom types and then you you start using bonds and concepts like that but of course chemistry is not all about bonds but there's more to it and um, so you have you know further interaction and further interactions so it's like one of these russian puppets where a lot of interactions uh, happen um, at different levels and basically this can all be nicely reflected um, through a neural network architecture and um, it can be learned so, so given a training set, what the neural network tries to learn is how these interactions manifest themselves for all the uh, molecules in the data set. And then it tries to, to generalize how these interactions work um, and then uses that to predict um, the, the atom-wise uh, contributions and essentially what, what it tries to learn is um, in the same way that um, if, you, um, if you think about, um, I mean, some of you may be familiar with, with the word to vector architecture, um, which was used in natural language processing, um, which was a, um, a very nice model that, that allowed to, to embed um, um, the, the word context of a text um, into some some vector representation. So so this is a very complex uh, thing in language, and that's that's very obvious because you know if you think about the 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 the, 
the environment where a word stands, um, then there's a lot of short range and low, long range interactions, and these need to be learned. So that's the nature of the word to vector architecture. And, and so in a way, we are using, we, we use a similar idea, but now we are trying to learn a chemical representation, which is the, the, the representation of the atom within its chemical context, the bond context, the higher interactions, and the longer you move around the graph. And that's, that's basically what we try to infer. So from the um, DTNN family, there's another one, which is the Schnett architecture. And um, it is a convolutive neural network, which is one of the very, uh, um, that people use a lot in, in uh, computer vision, uh, the convolutive architectures. And it basically came to the conclusion, if you usually in convolution, um, in, in computer vision, you would um, try to learn a filter, which is a discrete filter, um, in order to understand what are the local correlation properties of in images. Um, now, if you think about an image, the image anyway is very, um, you know, has a has pixel pixels, and it has doesn't have infinite resolution. So. Um, so a discrete filter is fine, but if you think about a molecule, the molecule can wiggle around uh, very, very delicately, and a very small wiggle or change in the in the orientation can actually um, give the same res response of the filter like that. Um, but fundamentally, the energy may be very different. So. For this reason, um, we introduced the continuous filter version of a CONSNET, and that's the SCHNET. So in other words, we have infinite resolution in some sense, um, and that's really a novel machine learning model. So in order to, to actually, um, I mean, the, 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 the whole, I mean, no one in machine learning would probably come to the conclusion that continuous filter conf nets would be something useful. But the, in the application of, of molecular dynamics, it's something completely obvious that you need this, right? So therefore, it, it, this is really something where we got highly inspired um, by the physics world. Okay, so this is now the detail of the uh, um, Schnett architecture, and there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, written on this. Um, just to get some, to make some remarks, so the Schnett works on one side very well for predicting molecular or materials properties, but also it works very well in for molecular dynamics. Um, so, and and one, for example, example that we had was the the fullerene, and um, where we could get with Schnett very nice uh, spectra uh, spectra properties, um, plus we could get very uh, long um, PMD trajectories and um, instead of um, sitting yeah, waiting for seven years on a supercomputer well I mean cumulative computing time of course um, you know the, the old laptop that I'm using would do it in seven hours um, so at the same accuracy which you know is something nice to have so, um, so it works for MD, it works for materials, and it works for molecules. It should be noted that for materials, this is much, I mean, materials are much more complex um, because there are some periodic boundary conditions and, and things are not as simple as for molecules. Okay, so if you want to try these things out, then there's some package that people have been using. Um, so I, I didn't know that the people from um, the climate science had been giving a talk. So I'm, I'm just, um, um, perhaps some of you will recognize this as well. So, but I can go more quickly. Um, so when you, you know, traditionally, um, 
when you take some kind of a, a neural network model or any kind of machine learning model, you know, you could put in something and you get an answer. In this case, you know, the model is a computer vision model that tries to um, distinguish roosters safe from cars and whatnot. I mean, there's some computer vision exercises that, you know, try to distinguish, you know, very different uh, types of, of, of pictures. Um, and one of the things that was worrying people is that, you know, all these models, they're black box models, so you don't know what's happening inside and why a certain um, classification was actually um, was actually done. So we we I mean, and this is actually a, a, a very hard mathematical problem, and um, because in a way this is a nonlinearity, and in order to to attribute the decision to features in the image. You would have to go backwards through the nonlinearity, which is, you know, non-trivial. And so, in 2015, we um, um, conceived an algorithm called Leo as relevance propagation, and later on uh, gave some theory for it. Um, and basically, now for a certain decision, in this case, you know, it's correctly classified as rooster we can get some heat map and these heat maps you've already seen in the prior talk that was also announced um, or uh, talked about by Kieran. And um, so, so you see that basically it's the rooster's comb that is most relevant for this um, neural network that happens to be AlexNet, uh, which was uh, done by Google. So um, essentially the, the layer as relevance propagation um, algorithm is able to um, put light in, into every black box and this means that we can um, take neural networks or kernel methods and we can understand why the kernel method says these are cats so it's different aspects of the moustache or the furry bit on the cat um, or why this is coffee, which here in the neural network thinks it's mainly the crema. And, and so all of these things can be um, explained now. And so, so um, the, the, the criticism that, that these nonlinear models um, cannot tell what, what they are doing and why they are doing something is not valid anymore. Um, and so, um, if we think about it, the most worrying thing for any scientist uh, applying machine learning was always that he, he or she could not really understand or get insight from the machine learning model because of this inability to explain things. And so people would usually use linear models because linear models are intrinsically very easy to explain. So let me just show this because probably this, the people that gave the talk already had this slide, uh, this, this picture. So um, now I told you before that the key ingredient, the standard model of machine learning is data, machine learning model, and then generalization. Um, so let me, ask the provocative, provocative question is, is the generalization error actually all that we need? Right. And so I, this is from our paper from 2016. It's the standard computer vision exercise. Um, so you take two models um, and a bunch of classes, and um, then you report the out of sample error, the generalization error for the different classes, and hopefully your model um, is better than the other models. And then you write a paper. So in a nutshell. Uh, so you see in some cases, the, the deep model is way better, right, for birds or for anything. But in some cases, it's, it's about the same quality as a very good old seasoned model like the Fisher. 
um, model. So, so this is not statistically significantly different. So you would think that if, you, if it comes to discriminating horses of other things, then you know, both models should be similar. And now we, we have the possibility to compare um, the explanation that they give. So both models say that this is a horse picture, right? Very clearly they say that. Now you can ask why does the neural network do that? And you can get the heat map. So you can see the horse's butt, the, 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 the horseman or the horse's nose is most relevant for this decision. And um, in this case, it's a horse woman. Um, and um, Fisher actually has some other ideas why this could be a horse. So it's basically looking around um, also the horse butt has some um, you know relevance for the decision but mainly the relevance comes from this area and if you look closely of what is in this area um, it's basically I read this to you it says fear the photo archive Lothar lens so that's um, basically a copyright tag um, so it turns out and you know this is a a database that has been used as a standard database in computer vision for about 10 years. And it turns out that in this class particularly, um, a lot of pictures in the training set and in the test set. So it's actually some quite intelligent behavior of this model because it focuses on what discriminates this horse from a sofa because there's no copyright tag on the sofa and um so but clearly um if you look at it then this neural network model has actually you know is generalizing well for good reasons because it understands the concept and the object and here this one is in a sense cheating right it looks at something that is in, in fact unrelated to the concept. Now, if you think about something more um, meaningful perhaps than discriminating horses, say cancer diagnostics, it's clear um, that you would like to rather be diagnosed by a model like that uh, than by a model like that. And so this, this type of behavior um, in the right way, because it's correct classification for the wrong reason, um, we, we, we call this the clever Hans behavior. And so because there was back in the days, um, in 1900 or so, there was a, a horse, a very famous horse um, in Berlin, um, and this horse was asked to um, solve math problems. Um, in fact, it got very famous for, for being actually able to solve these math problems. So, so the math problems would be adding some numbers and then the horse would knock at some wooden um, board uh, with his hoof um, as many times as the result was. And so it didn't get it wrong. I mean, and people were quite impressed that this horse could do math. And, you know, it was really a scientific sensation until somebody came and said, wait a minute, horses can't do math. How, how, you know, how, how does this add up? And, and then they actually found that the horse was very attentive to his master. And so basically the horse was reading its master and basically understanding when when to stop right and this is was not an intentional sign that the or tell that the master would give but it was just something you know and you know even another uh, unrelated person would um would be read by this horse so um so this this horse was called clever hans because you know it was clever uh, in that sense and it was giving the right answer for the wrong reason. So we call this behavior, uh, we call it clever Hans behavior. 
and so um, we, you know, wrote uh, some paper um, two years ago on this. So let's now look at whether the models that I've been showing to you are actually models that are just generalizing well and, and giving good good uh, predictions, but they could also give good predictions for the wrong reasons. So, you know, let's check whether they actually have some clever Hans moments. And so we can now look at the representation that the deep um, tensor neural network has learned. So, so it has learned all the, you know, the relation how to embed the atoms in its chemical context. And then we can, we can basically try to, um, uh, you know, try to visualize um, what what we call um, you know chemical potentials in quotes. You see the quotes here, um, and so so we visualize this, and um, it seems that this makes some sense, um, and and we can do this um, by probing the model. Um, we can also um, with this get some insights and um, so also we can look at what Schnett, the, the neural network um, architecture is doing in its hidden layer, how it's representing things and you can basically see that um, you know if you do a PCA um, in some some hidden layer representation then it, it actually has a very nice representation of um, different parts of the periodic table that it's just learning in order to predict the problem. And so it's quite interesting placing um, similar um, groups together. And if you look at some uh, materials um, and also about the, well, we call these the gummy bear plots. Um, so, you know, about these chemical potentials, um, then they do make sense. So um, it was quite relieving to us, honestly, to see that that our our uh, models didn't do much of a clever hunts here. Okay, so let me just um, switch. I mean, I think I have I have perhaps five more minutes or so, and I I think I will for this reason go you know skip through this part because uh, it's too much. Uh, and I've been spending too much time on clever hunts and friends. Um, and I would like to show you some um, also fun thing. Um, so, uh, which is the first part slightly unrelated to uh, chemistry. The second part, again, related to chemistry. So um, this is the first part. And um, so Kieran mentioned that I'm um, faculty at Korea University, visiting uh, uh, faculty. And um, so at the, you remember that the, the Koreans had the Winter Olympics um, some time ago, um, not very long, I think two years ago. Um, and so, one of the the ideas was to say, can we show, you know, what the what the Koreans ask themselves? Can we show, um, you know, high tech and scientific development um, very nicely in the context of Winter Olympics? And one of the um, quite hard games um, of the Winter Olympics is curling, and basically what we built. Um, and this was a huge team um, of Korea University collaborating with several other universities. So we, bought, uh, we built a curling robot. In fact, this is the curling robot that is throwing the stone. And this is the curling robot that is observing. And so basically what this curling robot learns is how to throw the stone. Um, so, and I think I should just try to play the video to you because it may actually show um, much better uh, what I can do. Let me see. Um, okay, here, this 
let's try this one. Okay, can you see now the Korean signs? Okay, good. So what you will see in the in the um, uh, for this. So if you if you um, type in AI hits ice to Berlin, then you get this video, and there's lots of other videos. And um, okay, so here's here's the the um, the curling robot or the thrower robot who um, you know has a, has puts his camera up and looks at the ice field. Um, and here you see the stone, and here you see um, some conveyor belt that is rotating um, the stone. So I'm continuing. So the first thing is that the robot sees where the heck all the stones are. And then um, big game. Similarly, strategic to go, except that you have less stones and um, that go is not placed on ice. But some people refer um, to curling as chess on ice, um, and um, and the, the the hard part about it is that the the, the whole ice conditioning of the and the whole problem is highly uncertain and variable. You know, the more stones you throw, the the more the ice quality changes. Okay, so here's uh, so the the robot now understands. Um, you know where the stones are, and now it tries to think about the strategy. What place the stone is, is the next one, and then it basically uh, makes up its mind, um, infers this, and then thinks about what are the what is the speed and the curl that it has to give to the stone in order to get to this point. So the interesting thing, so now it has to release at the hog line, and then the stone goes uh, for quite a while, um, and then pushes the yellow stone out, which is a nice one. So this is, of course, a very nice uh, stone, and we are playing against the best high school team in Korea, but we also played against the women Olympic team and um, the the wheelchair uh, Paralympic team, so very top teams in, in Korea. So um, if you want to read on this, um, there, there will be a paper coming out very soon in Science Robotics. So, so you can see the, that this is a very um, difficult um, problem because you have all these uncertainties and you could you know, you use differential equations to simulate the physics, but this, of course, will never, um, you know, uh, take care of the um, uncertainties and the, the changes of the ice quality. So, so if you would take the physics model um, and throw your stone accordingly, then the variance to where you want to go um, would be about two meters which is not enough to, to actually win against, um, you know, the, these, these uh, the Korean uh, uh, champions. Um, so um, let me just continue. Um, so, so this is just to show you that, you know, we can, we can also, I mean, so, so we use re deep reinforcement learning to solve this problem. And in this case, in, I mean, as opposed to, for example, Go or, or other games where you, where you are just in the computer, um, we have very, very few data points. So the number of throws up that, that we can learn from is super uh, um, And now it becomes physics again. This is a collaboration with uh, Stefan Taus and Christian Wagner and uh, bunch of my uh, uh, folks, um, uh, Christoph Schütt um, and uh, Malte Esters, and Leinen is also part of the, the team. So the, the people in Jülich, um, they have a scanning probe microscope. And um, so they are experimentalists, and they were part of the 2016 program. 
And um, so, so I think you, you know the, the kind of um, exercises that, that with a scanning probe microscope, you can pull out um, atoms from a surface and then put it somewhere else. And um, here the idea was to say, well, let's, let's not pull out atoms from the surfaces, but let's consider the situation where we have molecules that are um, sitting on the surface, um, you know, larger molecules with many atoms, you can see them, and let's try to pull them off the surface. It's like pulling off a Band-Aid from, you know, some skin, right? So, of course, the, the, the molecules, they like to stick there. So it's not trivial to, to take them off. Um, and so what you do is you have your tip from the scanning probe microscope, you take a, um, oxygen and then you pull. And if you do this, like in, um, in the usual way, then um, the problem is that usually you actually observe, you measure with a scanning probe microscope. Now you're pulling. Um, so right, since you're pulling, you cannot observe anymore because, you know, there's nothing left to, to observe, right? So, so because we are pulling with what, what you would usually observe. And so, so you're basically blind. And um, if you, you know, pull, then what happens is that quite often the bond breaks and then the molecule goes back to its place. So you can pull it off easily. And if you, if you use a human and force feedback and you do 50 experiments or so, then um, a skilled human can do two out of 50. Um, pulling off the molecule. So um, in our case, we were rather um, 46, 48, something um, times out of 50 where we could pull this off. And we use also reinforcement learning and with very few um, um, data points. Um, and you may actually wa wonder why the heck are we doing this, right? <laughs> And so if you think about it, basically assume that your idea would be to do something like autonomous nanofabrication. So you would like to build things. And if you build things from single atoms, it's quite tedious. Um, but if you take bigger molecular structures and you put them off, put them somewhere, then you can easily build a house or some, some object. Um, and but but this was not possible because it's so difficult to practically do that um, because it, usually this the the um, um, scanning probe tip breaks from the oxygen. So and and again we used machine learning for this and it was very tricky to in, invent a, a reinforcement learning algorithm that could do this for very very few data points. And also one of the problems here, as well as in the in the curling case, was that the this was is a highly highly variant system. So so from one pull to the next, the properties of the tip change completely. So it's like the ice quality. So you can't reuse much of the learning method. So you have to transfer in a very gentle way. So this is art. And this, this paper actually appears in Science Advances tomorrow. So with that, I, I already went over time. I would like to conclude. Um, so I explained a bit of the IPEM story of our programs, um, showed the DTNN and the SNET um, that are actually learning the chemical environments. Um, and that, that, you know, where you can um, give, do molecular dynamics and predict um, certain quantum chemical properties um, very easily. The part what, where I, that I skipped was that this SGDML method actually um, gets um, um, potential energy surfaces at CCSDT quality. Um, 
nowadays with systems to up to two or three hundred atoms. Um, so the challenge is actually to get some of the training data. <laughs> and, and so um, one of the key aspects was to test and to validate whether the model that we have learned in all these exercises is actually doing some clever hunts or whether it's learning some chemistry and what exactly in terms of chemistry or physics is it, is it learn? And so, you know, the whole exercise showed that machine learning is very useful for physics and chemistry, but also you can see that some of the models that we invented in order to solve um, some of the chemistry problems, they actually gave rise to, to new, um, genuinely new machine learning models that would never have come up in the field. So it's, it's actually a give and take, which is very exciting, I think. And it's just the start. So with that, I would like to make some advertisement. There's a book on machine learning meets quantum um, physics, very recent, um, it appeared this summer. Um, so in 2020, there's, um, well, if my slides will ever converge, um, there should be something coming. Oh, I'm not sure. Ah, okay, good. So there's two other books, um, one on explainable AI that we had um, last October. So you can also read that. Um, and there's also some older book. It's a neural network tricks of the trade. It's a second edition. And I think it's, it, I mean, in Springer, it's, I think the has, has something like 2.1 million downloads by now. Um, so it's uh, popular. So thank you very much. Uh, for your attention. And um, since you do have uh, Springer access probably at UCI, I recommend uh, downloading these books. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you very much, yes. We have uh, <clears throat> a little time for questions, right? Um, I, I, I could start with one. I don't know if I missed, but uh, was the heat map uh, a totally separate model, or was he analyzing uh, hidden layers performance? Well, I, I was very quickly because I inferred that from Kieran's introduction that that there was something introduced in the former by for some former speakers. So let me let me just um, try to be be more careful in, in saying what what the heat map does. So. So assume that you have a model. The model is fixed and it's trained. And it's, it can be my model, it can be your model, it can be Google's model, right? So assume that you have that model. Then you take some data point inside um, and you, you run it through the model. Then you get a prediction. And then the question is, how, why is this prediction as it is? Why is this a rooster? Why is this, you know, an energy of whatever kcal, right? So, um, and now the, the, the question is, because you have this nonlinear machinery, um, so, so let me, I'm, I'm, I'm taking, and I'm, I'm trying to do some, some uh, um, hand waving, right? And it's very hard um, to, um, through video chat. So, so assume that, you know, this is the classification surface, right? And um, in some feature space. Actually, so this is, this, this, this sorry. Yes. Can you just shop, stop sharing your screen and then we'll, we'll ah. we can all go to uh, speaker mode and see you much better. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay. is that so better? Go, yes, if everybody goes to speaker view, I okay. uh, able to see much better. Okay, good. So now, now, now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm showing this, this um, decision surface. So now I'm, one data point is here, and it's classified as, say, because on this side could be, you know, the, the roosters, okay? So then you wonder, 
why is this a rooster? And um, and you you know basically you can ask how far am I from this nonlinear decision surface? But so it's not only a local question, but it's also a global one because the decision surface can be bended in many ways. So um, the, what LRP does um, effectively, and one can prove this, is that one can basically think about the, I mean, so if you would like to, to understand the decision surface, you could do a, a global Taylor expansion of this unknown function, right? Just put, put it relatively. And, and if, you, if you do that, um, then of course the problem is that you, you know, practically you can't because, you know, if you go to a higher order Taylor expansions, it's terrible in high dimensional space. But what you could do is you could do a linear Taylor expansion uh, you know, around some different points, right? So in other words, this nonlinear decision surface is, is, is linearly And if you now think about it, then you can show that this linear, local linear approximation is equivalent to the global nonlinear uh, Taylor expansion. And the neural network and the LRP algorithm that puts the information through the model is exactly doing this local linear approximation at every layer, right? So, so in, in other words, the layer-wise relevance propagation algorithm collects information from, from upper layers um, and tries to review and the, the size of the weights actually is very indicative of the information flow. Now, all, all of what I'm saying is hand-waving, but <laughs> there's a number of very nice papers where, where you can actually get all the proofs and everything. So, okay. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Yes, please. Very general question. So when we first met and first started doing some stuff together, you were very keen on the kernel ridge regression, right? Mm -hmm. But I noticed in your summary, you were saying that, well, you know, it uses a fixed representation. And now lots of what you're doing is, is with deep neural nets. Mm -hmm. So have you undergone a religious conversion from uh, ridge regression to deep neural nets, or can you comment? I, I guess uh, not uh, quite quite pragmatic, perhaps. Um, uh -huh. So so maybe I should say that I'm I'm you know old generation. So this means that I've been doing neural nets, and then I've been doing kernel methods, and then I've been doing neural nets, but. Practically, I'm also still doing kernel methods. I think there's, there's, it's, it's useless to, um, I mean, I think people who say that one method is best, th this is usually nonsense. Um, so, so I think the, the method is best that solves the problem. <laughs> okay, and now why, why is it interesting to use a neural network? So assume that you have a lot of data, which you never have in uh, quantum chemistry. Um, then, then these scale well, right? So, so any kind of kernel method, um, you know, is at its limits at, at, at a couple million data points. But if you have billion data points, then, then, you know, you can, I mean, you have to wait very long. So, so this is not the reason, right? Or the scaling aspect, because we never have so many data points. So the, the other thing that, that is perhaps more of a reason is um, that in, an, in the kernel method, you have the kernel that describes you, I mean, I showed the Gaussian kernel where the, the, with, the, um, um, with, with the distance, uh, Frobenius distance and with the um, kernel width. So mm -hmm. it, it means that, that you basically um, 
actually look at the similarity at a certain scale. Now, I think in, in, in physics or chemistry, the, also in, in, in climate science, things are notoriously multi-scale. So you don't have one scale, but you have several scales. And so, so either you know them, and then you can take multiple kernels. Mm -hmm. So that's one possibility. Or you learn them, and then you, you actually infer what are the right scales, and the, the, the network figures it out. And that's basically the idea of the deep tensor neural network, which, which allows to understand what is the property of um, an atom in its chemical context in the same sense as what is the property of a word in a text context, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but are you not happy with this? <laughs> uh, no, no, I've been sort of mulling it over and but it also suggests that if, if there could be some advance to make it easier to put in multiple scales in, in the kernel methods, you know, for them to be found rather than, uh, you know, so some people put in the hyperparameters, they choose them, others find them, right? Uh, yes. But if there's a generalization that, that uh, could do yeah. that, might make it competitive again. Yeah. I, I think in, in, in multiple, I mean, in, in kernel methods, there's a method called multiple kernel learning, where you basically try to just combine a bunch of kernels. Right. So mathematically right. speaking, means you know, taking one kernel means that you're you're comparing things at a certain scale, or in other words, you're um, looking at things in one particular Hilbert space. And if you if you have different scales, then you would have to to take an outer product of several Hilbert spaces. But yeah. the, the math and everything and the algorithmics has been done for this. Okay. It's just a bit tedious. Yes. Yes, but but it's. I mean, I think it's not overly tedious, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. It can be coded. Yeah. Uh, well, it has been coded, so it should be okay. 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 Uh, so, do we have any more questions for Klaus? It's uh, it's almost ten after midnight in Germany. I it's, believe. it's okay. It's okay. I'm awake now. So I mean, <laughs> he's ready to go for another three hours. Yeah, uh, well, maybe not three, but you know, two is fine. <laughs> so clever Hans might be smarter than mathematicians, if I understood it correctly. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it was quite surprising to some uh, mathematicians that a horse could do math, math but um, again, um, they found this out quickly. <laughs> but I mean, if you if you look at clever Hans um, and and Hors, uh in Wikipedia, it has a very beautiful um, picture of the of the, of the horse. Yeah, it's a nice horse. I have a question. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm a mathematician. So in general, uh, also I'm uh, doing PDEs. So if you have a mapping between two very large spaces, mm -hmm. very large spaces, and you only have 10,000 million, a billion points, I still don't think you can really um, fill the space that well and can pre predict things well. Mm -hmm. To me, Absolutely. many things it works is because there are some underlying, either your parametric model or your factors are limited finite so there is a low dimensional uh structure in the data in the testing you have that ways of course that's nonlinear map still very difficult to uh to to construct in general but that's probably hopeful you can using this learning to do so what i'm trying to say is when you predict the solution to a pde if my pde is not like well behaved like a heat equation or diffusion equation uh, map something to a small dimension. It's really rich, like high frequency wave equations. Then mm -hmm. I do not see how these learning things can work there. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're raising a very important point. So um, I think 
this is, you know, always assumed on the side by everybody who's in the field. Um, and perhaps, you know, machine learning is not something, it's not some wizardy, right? So you cannot all of a sudden um, fill high dimensional spaces with few points, right? This, <laughs> this, this, is, this would be wizardy. No, but, but what you can, I mean, but most practical problems really, um, they live on comparatively low manifolds, right? Of course, you don't know them and you, these may be very highly folded and depending on the representation they're using, they can be, you know, very smooth and nice or they can be, you know, complex. And so, so I think the idea of the neural network or um, of the appropriate kernel method would be that you use a representation and you unfold this in a nice way so that things are low dimensional and, and um, then you can easily um, deal with the problem because since they are low dimensional, it's, it's, it's all a matter of the effective dimensionality. Yes. And I'll yes. just okay. give an example. So assume, I mean, this is a very silly example, but um, assume that you do, um, you, you, you will do a prediction um, and you would like to do a regression of a sine wave, okay? So, so then it's very obvious that if you take a sine kernel, right, of the right frequency, that you only need one parameter. So the manifold is only one dimension. Yes, yes, and I, I agree with you. In general, but, but you're if absolutely you, if right. You, you know, the thing is... If um, you take a, let me just, if you take a silly kernel, like a polynomial kernel, then yes. you need expansions to all infinity, which you, yeah. Taylor expansion yeah. shows. you. So, so then the, I mean, so the question is, how do I get this very low dimensional representation? And so, so I think the, the, the neural network answer to this is, you try, you try to get it um, by learning. And you know, you have a model that has enough parameters that it's rich enough to, to get this effective representation. And if you, if you take kernel method, then, then the, the, the same thing applies. Um, but if you say, for example, if you take a, an equation that is more, more complex, like Navier-Stokes, um, where you have different scales and all interacting and giving a big mess. So, so then it's not so easy, right? Because effectively the whole thing is high damage. And so yeah. then the question, but, but maybe um, you have- Yeah, so I think I agree with you. So an interesting question would be, how do you know your problem? You, know, you don't know how the exact structure, that's something you don't know, but how do you know whether you, your problem is, has a low dimensional hope? Uh, so of course, for example, I can see in your curling example, you only have a few factors. You don't know how they interplay, but these few factors probably is a smooth map to where it's landed. So mm. that's probably is still a small, smooth, low dimensional function. You can use that. But my question is, can you use just simple interpolation? You have where location around the target is and map to where the parameter is. You do some averaging to find out the optimal, uh, you know, shooting angle or strength. That probably work too, if um, it's a smooth. Uh, yes, the unfortunate thing, like in particular in curling, is that it's not very smooth, and it's very combinatorial. So the the problem is not that you, I mean, okay. So the problem is, of course, that that you would like, I mean, you would like to hit a target, and then you need to, you know, get the trajectory there, right? But you don't know what happened in between. Right, so because you know a lot of stones have gone, and if you do the same throw at different times, um, the variance is about two meters. So you have to learn what the change of the ice is as over as a function of time from your throws. So that's one thing. The other thing is, um, it's it's not only about putting a stone, but it's about winning. So winning means that you you try to hedge the risk. So in other words, if you have the, the opponent's stones there, 
So um, then the question is, what is a safe throw that is also most um, harming to the opponent, right? So, so you could have the ideal, optimal throw. In the best worlds, you, if you could precisely perform it, then you know, it would be the killer throw, so to say. But practically, there's always a certain variance even if you're a robot performs this. Um, and so then, you know, this, your throw can go astray and the game is lost. So, so this is a very, very complex kind of uh, um, optimization problem because it, it involves not only the throwing itself, but also the planning and the long-term strategic thinking. And that's the combinatorics. This is the chess part of things. But, but in principle, if, if we would just take the part um, that you're referring to, which is the throw, then the question is, um, do, these pra uh, do, do the throw parameters vary smoothly? And, and they do to some extent, okay? And so, so, so you know, but they, you know, the left and right curls for example, there's some non-smoothness in this. Okay. Thank you. Well, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, so it's, I think it's, uh, um, so, so just to, to um, so you can, um, so what, I mean, people have been, building very complex differential equations on this. In particular, the Japanese, uh, uh, there's a Japanese team that is very um, um, excited about curling and, and simulating kernel, uh, curling. Um, and, you know, the curling has, the curling flaws, they have these little pebbles on them. And so, you know, there's the rotation of the stone with the curl. And so, the, the front part of the stone and the back part of the stone, they have a different, um, um, they have a different properties on the, on the uh, pebbles. So this is very highly nonlinear. Um, and, and these people have made these equations, have understood these equations very well. So if you simulate this, you can simulate this on the computer and you can learn this. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah I um, agree. But, but then if you do it in reality, you have to correct for this because it's never the same. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if you want to learn the <laughs> dynamics, you'll learn things mm. in the infinite dimensional space. Um, yes. But I'm thinking whether you can parameterize the problem. So it's really kind of inferring or interpolation of a mapping rather than learning the whole dynamics because that's learning in an infinite dimension. That's definitely is hard. But the yeah. question is whether you can parameterize the problem so that you can do some kind of. Let me, I, I will get a glass of water and then I will get an answer to you. It's Shall very we? nice that the bandwidth uh, held up well since yes. from Berlin. Yes, yes. that allows amazing. us to be, you know, when could um, we have uh, Professor Miller in Southern California? Well, I mean, I would gladly go there, but you know, at the moment, maybe it's not advisable. And so, so um, let me let me come back to your question. So, I, I think there's a you know a fundamental um, clash between um, the you know the PDE and mathematics people and the machine learning people, which I think is is a bit um, unfortunate because I think it's, it's, uh, it's a bit useless too, <laughs> right? Um, so I think um, because it's not about, uh, okay, so I think the, the point that I want to make is the following. So if you, um, so I imagine you would have the ideal model, right? So you would be God and you would know the, the true differential equation, right? Then, then um, you know, you could parameterize this and learn the parameters, and you would be done, right? But practically, um, you would not have these divine insights, and there would be some some uh, noise and some nonlinearities that you have not captured. And for this reason, 
um, you know, people who um, try to um, build, say, neural network models or, or kind of machine learning models that are trained end to end, they are actually able to to uh, make these predictions very well. Um, basically, for the moment, ignoring these divine differential equations. So from the pragmatic point of view, this is very helpful. Now, from the point of view, um, what I raised also before, namely that in the end you want to understand, it's not about prediction only, it's about understanding, it's about getting insights. Um, then you need to go back from your model to the differential equations. And this part is very rarely uh, pursued. So we have um, a graduate school in Berlin that where mathematicians and, and computer scientists and machine learners are sitting together trying to go this direction, but it's very hard. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, just like computation, you know, if you have a uh, large scale separation, maybe you would better using some asymptotic uh, method to understand the things mm -hmm. rather than using computer to resolve all the small mm -hmm. skills. But if you have everything comparable, then you probably mm -hmm. have the only way to do it use computation. I, I have the same feeling. I feeling, you know, nothing, maybe something should not learn everything from scratch, but using mm -hmm. model and based, you know, when model is basically used for explaining local small perturbation, mm -hmm. uh, but that's very effective. Uh, but when you have global nonlinear things, how you connect the dots together, maybe machine learning is, a, is something to give a good representation. Uh, yes. But what I'm trying to say is, um, again, you know, I think sometimes yeah. the model, yeah. it's better to play, seems to me, I'm, I'm not an expert in machine learning, yeah. but it seems to me, uh, sometimes the model should be able to help or uh, reduce the degrees of freedom and many things in order to be more effective, more robust, and so on and so forth. I, I'm completely with you. So, um, so I, I remember you had another question, which was, um, how can we know what is the intrinsic dimension of the manifold? So there's actually, um, I mean, this is of course almost, um, you know, a philosophical question on to, to some extent, but if I come from the machine learning point of view, it's not philosophical question because I may, I have a model that predicts and I can analyze the model and try to understand what is the intrinsic, the effective number of parameters, the intrinsic dimensions. And we, we have a series of papers on this um, in kernel methods, 2008, Brown et al, and 2011, um, Montavon et al. So the, the, these are with bounds and, you know, with the um, appropriate mathematical rigor, I would say. Maybe not, not for the true mathematician, but I think from the machine learning point of view, it's enough proofs uh, to make everybody happy. Um, so, so that's that's one thing. So um, I didn't come to this part. I skipped it. But um, assume that you have some knowledge, um, and so um, I skipped the part which was, was about predicting force fields or modeling force fields in molecular dynamics. So so you you know if you look at this very innocently, it's just taking. The molecular configurations, which are x, y, z coordinates for every atom, um, and mapping them to forces, right? And so, so if you can learn this map, then you're done because you can just run molecular dynamics, right? So if you <clears throat> if you think about it, there's a million way ways to actually map x, y, z coordinates to vectors, right? To, to a vector field. But the point is a force field is not any vector field, it's a conservative vector field. So, so exactly what you're saying, there's some structure in it, some mathematical structure that is highly important and that you know because, you know, the, 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 these, these force fields, it's in this universe, energy conservation holds. Right, and so so therefore, if you if you factor this in, you can build models that are only working on this manifold, and with this 
you can save data points. Um, in, in our case, we could show this. Um, I think this was the factor of 100 or 200. Um, so, so, you know, if you think about one data point costing seven days, right? Whether you can compute 50,000 data points or whether you compute 500 data points makes a huge difference. So, so, but that's exactly the things that you're alluding to, right? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, sorry for dragging the long, I, I promise you this, this is my last question. Uh, so you said you have a way to, uh, to using machine learning to see the intrinsic uh, uh, yes. dimension. Uh, so did you try, say, using some parametric model to generate the data and try to use machine learning to learn really how many parameters you used in your model? Yeah, well, I mean, um, so <clears throat> the idea is, is, quite a, um, is, is quite simple. So, so I'm not sure whether, I mean, probably you're familiar with, the, with kernel PCA. So, yeah. and so, so basically the question is, well, in kernel PCA, um, if you, if you think about it and you, you look at the spectrum of the kernel matrix, then you can see it's decay, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that concerns the variance. Yes. So what, what is relevant, um, in, in any kind of prediction problem is not only the variance of the data, but it's also um, how does the variance relate to the labels? Okay. So it's so we need to look at not the 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 eigen uh, spectrum, but the eigen spectrum projected to the labels. I see. And what we could prove, and that's very very interesting, and and in fact we're lucky, <laughs> um, um, is the following. So if you think about. Um, so, so, you know, if you, if you think about the variance of the data, then it's clear if it's a low dimensional manifold, then this decays in the appropriate representation. Yes. But this doesn't need to be the same if you have some labels that you try to classify, right? But what we, we could show that essentially it's still the leading eigenvalues of the kernel PCA that are relevant. Okay. So, so you, can, you can give a bound to the subspace that is relevant, that's the task relevant subspace. And this bound is, is um, on the decay of this bound is, is directly proportional to the eigenspectrum. Okay. So it's a small sample bound. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, um, I think I, I think we're going to call it a day at this point. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's the other day, right? <laughs> so, um, but now I think Klaus, you know, I think you have earned that beer. Uh, oh, thank you. I I, I, allow, I allow you to take one out of your neighbor's uh, fridge. <laughs> Very uh, nice. <laughs> you, you have to come back. Uh, yes. Gotta have a sequel to this. Yeah, very good. Yes. So very good. It's 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 not as good to. Uh, I mean, this great overview of so many things uh, going on, including curling, uh, but also I think getting to discuss uh, is is not so easy at the moment. And and this has been very uh, very uh, helpful as well. So thank you very much for doing this despite the late hour. Uh, and let's thank Klaus again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you for thank the you. questions. That was okay. great. Uh, that was great. And we'll probably have one more uh, in September uh, uh, to be announced. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you Klaus. Bye-bye. Okay. Then have a nice one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.